welcome. I'm very pleased to bring to you today Valerie Langfield from the UK will be phoning in about Roger Quilter, his life and music. Valerie, hello. Hello. How, How are, are you? you? I'm fine. Very nice to talk to you. Oh, it's wonderful to have you with us today. Valerie, you decided to write a book on Roger Quilter, and when did that happen? In May 1996. It's very precise. I was at a at a party and talking to somebody, and quite by chance he, w he was talking about some music and saying, by the way, you realize there's no biography of Roger Quilter, don't you? And I, I just thought it sounded an interesting thing to do. I've always known his music. Since I was a child, I've always known his music. And when and I studied singing as a postgraduate student, I learned many of the songs then. So it didn't, it wasn't unknown to me when I heard that uh, there was nothing about him. But um, it's been so interesting. The people I've met have been just fascinating. Wonderful. And now, let me, let me ask, you first heard uh, Roger Quilter's music at a Robert Mayer concert, is that correct? That's right. They were concerts for children, and they were held at the Royal Festival Hall, a, a big, huge uh, concert venue on the, the South Bank of London, and it was conducted by Samuel Consultant. And it was such a beautiful piece of music, joining up lots of nursery rhymes, and it was so fresh and charming, and it, it's retained its charm no matter how many times I hear it. It's still kept that freshness. Beautiful piece. Wonderful. Valerie, tell us a little more about who Roger Quilter is. Well, he was quintessentially English. He was uh, very tall, not that, that particularly makes him English, but he came of an upper-class family with a lot of money in a family where you didn't do music. You might sing the odd song, play a little piano piece, because that was the, the nice thing to do. But you certainly didn't go in for music professionally. This really, it just wasn't done. So from that point of view, his family was fairly philistine, but also fairly normal. So it was, it was quite hard for him, and he was, he was always ill, uh, and his family were always terribly healthy and very hale and hearty and hunting, shooting and fishing. So he was a bit of a, a fish out of water, really. But he did write these beautiful songs that have a really English flavor about them, and they are still sung now. They're very much part of the, of the repertoire for any, any concert singer. Yes. Um, tell us a little bit more about his family. Well, he grew up in the south of England, but then they moved to the east of England in Suffolk, which is right on the very edge of the North Sea. So you look out onto the North Sea and then way across to Europe. And he had four brothers, correct? He, he had four brothers and two sisters, so it was quite a large family. And he, he was absolutely devoted to his mother, uh, but she was quite a powerful personality. Uh, but that, that was okay. Uh, they, they could handle that. Uh, but he, he really didn't like the rest of his family. The, the, the children of some of his uh, brothers and sisters he, he liked, um, but not that, not that many. He had nothing in common with them, but they were all tall. That was the, the, the sweet thing. Um, he was tall and all his brothers were tall. So um, that pleased his mother. He, she always wanted sons over six feet tall, and she got them. Was he the only musical one in the family? Very much, very much so. Okay. Um, yes, the, I mean, the, some of the, 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 his two sisters, the, um, one was called Maud and the other was called Nora. Nora liked music to some extent, but um, not to do it professionally. This was, if you were of that class and they had a lot of money, you just didn't do this. Sure. And it's hard, it's hard to take on board now just how, uh, how much you, you didn't do it. We would like to go to play uh, Go Lovely Rose. Oh, beautiful. Oh, that's 
That piece just moves me so much, being a singer-songwriter myself. Um, and you are in the musical area as well. Um, you have a PhD. Uh, I'm working on it. Wonderful. I haven't quite got it yet. A little, a little longer to go, but not much. But while you were working on Quilter's book, this has been part of the journey for you, hasn't it? Yes. Yes. It Wonderful. Has. Yes. You know, uh, that, I. That, Sorry, oh. I was just going to say that's one of his finest songs and it sends shivers down my back. And please tell us a little bit about who is performing in that. Well, that was Quilter himself playing the piano. He was a very fine pianist mm -hmm. and he'd trained as a pianist at the Frankfurt Conservatory. He also studied composition in Frankfurt. The singer was Mark Raphael. Now, Quilter's first singer was a tenor called Jervis Elvis who was killed at the railway station in Boston, Massachusetts in 1921 and he had brought quilter songs to an audience and made them famous and made quilter famous after he was killed then quilter met mark raphael who was a baritone high baritone mm -hmm. <coughs> and he uh, mark was a, a protege really of quilter so he brought mark on uh, but mark also sang his song and in 1934 they recorded that song Wonderful. It is a beautiful piece. As yes. well as, I'd like to know some of other um, quilters, other famous friends, possibly a little bit about Percy Granger, because oh. I know he was in, influential in um, quilters' lives. So would you tell us a little yes. bit about Yes, yes. They, they met when they were both at the Frankfurt Conservatory. And it's really so strange. They were such complete opposites. Granger had such energy and where he was Australian and would, uh, when he was on tour in Australia, would walk between his, his concerts. It's really quite strange. And Quilter was always ill and always terribly the gentle gentleman and shy and uh, wouldn't put himself forward. And Granger was quite the opposite. He was a, a very outgoing concert pianist and composer. And they were, they were almost like chalk, and, well, they were like chalk and cheese. And mm -hmm. I think that's, that's why they really got on. They responded to the opposite in each other. Granger wrote thousands of letters throughout his life. Eventually, he, he became a naturalized American citizen. But they, were, they exchanged a huge correspondence for the rest of their lives. It's absolutely wonderful and very touching. And they would talk about their music to each other whenever they met, and they met as often as they could. Granger was always on a quilter to come out and stay with him in the States. Granger lived in White Plains in New York City, mm. but Quilter never quite managed it. But they could bounce ideas off each other and they supported each other's work. It was, it was a very strong friendship 
and they really Wonderful. sent a huge amount to each other. Let me so ask this. Um, also, wh what were the influences of, of uh, Quilter's teacher, Edith? Oh, it's hard to say what? because she was, she was really only his piano teacher when he was at preparatory school, when he was a little boy. But uh, she must have had some influence because she, she certainly used to play songs of the period to him. So he grew up with all these drawing room songs in his mind, in his head. And when he first began writing songs, it was that kind of thing that he wrote. But I think really, um, his second school that he went to, Eton, he hated. So he did at least have a good memory of school from, from this school and Edith Brackenbury. And later he dedicated some piano music to her, which was very, very sweet. And what wrote, pieces were those? That they they, they were little piano pieces called country pieces. Oh, wonderful. And she wrote a little letter back to him, just thanking him and saying, she did nothing. She just got the, the earth ready for sewing. And he was, he was the one. It was a very, very sweet letter she wrote. Sure. Now, you learned piano as well as a youngster. You were six years old? Oh, gosh, yes. I, I was six when I began having piano lessons. And the piano is very important to me. And I, I work a lot with the piano. I teach the piano, and I love that. Wonderful. We would like to go to another piece, O Good. Mistress Mine. Lovely. O oh, mistress mine, where are you roaming? Oh, stay and hear your true love's coming That can sing both high and low Trip no further, pretty sweeting Journeys end in lovers' meeting Every wise man's son doth know Is love, tis not hereafter. Present mirth hath present laughter. What's to come is still unsure. In the delay there lies no plenty. Then come kiss me, sweet and twenty. Youth's a stuff will not endure. No. Oh, that music just fills my soul. Yeah. Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit more about Quilter's later years of his life, maybe some of the things that he helped some people with. Yes, he, he didn't like being wealthy. It sounds a little strange, but he always felt rather guilty about it. So he used his money to help as many people as he could, as long as they deserved it uh, or and were in real need. So he would help young musicians. Uh, he helped quite a lot of black musicians coming. Some of them came from the States. Marian Anderson he helped. Mm -hmm. And also Roland Hayes, a little bit before Marian Anderson. Uh, he was a, a tenor. And he would give them a little bit of financial backing just to make sure that they could survive. And sometimes they would, it would be a loan and, and they would eventually pay it back. But, but uh, I don't think he was terribly fussed about getting the money back. But he was very supportive. But he, it was very much aimed at young musicians. And he also helped Jews, some, some friends of his who were Jewish, help them get out of Vienna just before the Second World War. And that was very important to have money because that was the means by which they could be allowed into England. They had to have financial backing. Certainly. But he was glad to be able to do that. And that, and that meant a lot to him. Wonderful. If you could have met Roger Quilter, Valerie, and asked him oh. one question, what would that have been? Oh, there are so many. Can I, can I scrounge two questions? I would love to have known what song he was most proud of, because he never thought much of what he could do. And I'd also like to know which was his favorite song. Okay, certainly. So, so I've cheated a bit there. But. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite all right. Um, Thank you. you as well come from a musical family. You have two sons and a husband of 20 years. 
Yes. That are all musical and play guitar yes. and have yes. bands. Yes. yes. And a, my, my, I guess uh, a, a son that's, that's, that's a drummer? Uh, yeah, my older son's a drummer in a, a little rock band called yeah. Idiom. And they've made a CD and, and they're doing quite nicely. Wonderful. And and how, how old is he? Uh, my elder son is 17. So he's still in college, so they, they have to do it alongside all their college work. But they, they work very hard. It's, it's nice to hear. And they, they write all their own stuff as well. It's not, uh, not cover stuff. So that's, that's nice. That's Could nice. you tell us why Roger Quilter may not have had a family? Oh, he was gay. And at a time when it was illegal. Uh, and it was really serious. You, you had to keep very, very quiet about it. And some could cope. And although he was happy and proud and it didn't have a problem within himself about being gay, he, in fact, he felt it was very important to at least have had a homosexual experience if you were going to be a composer. Mm. Otherwise, you couldn't <laughs> be a good composer. But his family weren't, and you had to be terribly careful. Otherwise, you just laid yourself wide open to blackmail, arrest, and imprisonment. Sure. Uh, it was awful. Just so a, did just he keep that hidden? Did he keep that hidden through all those years of his uh, composing? He, by and large, yes. And a lot of people obviously did realize, but a, a, a lot of people didn't. There were women um, who, who were absolutely devoted to him and thought he might be a possible husband and just didn't realize, just had no clue. These mm -hmm. things just weren't talked about. Sure. It's sure. awful. Well, his music is lovely. He's also done some orchestral pieces. Yes. Uh, would you describe a little bit of that for us? I think the most important orchestral work that he wrote was Where the Rainbow Ends. It's the incidental music to the children's fairy play. Certainly. And it first came out in 1911, and Noel Coward was in the first performance. And it was an absolute hit. Everyone would go to see that at Christmas, and also they would go to see Peter Pan. And it ran every year, every Christmas, for nearly 50 years. And it would tour around Britain as well. And the, it was, the music was incredibly well known, absolutely phenomenally. It, it was turned into uh, piano solo music so people could play it at home. Uh, the book, there was a book written of the play, and that went into, oh, so many editions. I've got three completely different editions of it. Same story. Oh. And it was a, a really good children's story with goodies and baddies and a dragon king. How and wonderful. George, and it is a real adventure. Marvelous, absolutely marvelous. Cracking story. And the music is so atmospheric, so period, and just perfect. The way Quilter did a lot of his pieces. Yes. Um, we would love to play a piece that is from Where the Rainbow Ends. Splendid. And um, would you have any other words on Quilter's, uh, towards the end of his life, what his goals may have been from the people that you met? I think his goal was, well, he had a favorite nephew, uh, and he was absolutely devoted to him, Arnold Vivian. And I think he saw Arnold as, well, he, he, he made Arnold his heir, and he saw Arnold as a person who would carry on his music. Mm. But Arnold was killed in unpleasant circumstances in the Second World War, and it destroyed Quilter. It, uh, there were other things going on. He had an operation, um, but it upset the balance of his mind, and he, he'd always been depressed throughout his life. And he ended up in a mental hospital for a few months, being mm. sorted out. But it was a very, very sad uh, twilight of his years because he was so devoted to Arnold. Broke, it absolutely broke his heart. It, sure. It so he's, he suffered quite a bit. And, oh, you he know, did. with the phenomenal talent that he had, yes. and, and his life was so marred by tragedy, yes. that you described in the book, and it was wonderful to, to read about how the art comes from such tragedy. Yes. Uh, I just think his talent is phenomenal. Yes. Um, we would love to play a piece from Where the Rainbow Ends, and it's oh, Rosamund. So Good. we'll do that now. Lovely.
I'm writing a musical myself, um, so it's so beautiful to hear a piece that was performed for all, over 40, 50 years. Yes. Um, yes. Is Quilter's music still popular? Hugely, and I'm delighted to say I get a lot of inquiries from singers and um, singing uh, majors in the States um, emailing me through my website on Quilter to ask about the songs, where can they get them, and they're performing this and they want to know a little bit more, which is, I'm so delighted about that, and I'm always very pleased to answer as well. They are beautiful songs, and they, they always lie really well in the voice, and they're, 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 they're grateful to sing, and they're immensely rewarding. They really are. And yes, they are very, very much uh, still sung and still popular. There's a lot of CDs being produced of his songs. Wonderful. And mm. what are your two favorite pieces? Oh, well, you've played one of them, Go okay. Lovely Rose. Wonderful. Um, actually, and Rosamond is a favorite as well. There is one more song that is a particular favorite of mine called Drooping Wings which is out of print, I'm sorry to say, but it is possible to get second-hand copies and archive copies. But that's another lovely song. It's hard to say, to be honest, which is my <laughs> favorite, because at one level, all of them are my favorites. They're all lovely. <laughs> yes, yes. I wanted to ask you on a more personal note, um, you are very involved in music, and not only did you do some reading of music at Girton, correct? That's right, Girton College, Cambridge. Yes. And that's Cambridge, UK. Yes. Um, explain a little bit about your digital music that you're doing with Jonathan. Oh, we, it's it, quite simple. We, we make MIDI files. We take classical music, and I get the score, and I uh, play the music. It's not scanned in, as some people do. I play it in instrument by instrument and build it up. And then my co-director, who's a sound engineer, and he's in Australia, uh, he puts all the, the post-production onto it to make it sound as near to the real thing as you can get, but of course it isn't the real thing. Certainly. And then people can take those MIDI files and perhaps look at one particular instrument, see what the piece would sound like if you change the instrument, and get to grips with the, the actual piece of music in a way that's quite tricky to do otherwise if you're just working with the score and just working with the live music. Um, it's different. It's different. I'm not saying you shouldn't listen to the live music, mm -hmm. but it's, it's a way of, of um, getting inside the music in a most interesting way, really interesting. If, if Quilter were alive today, um, where do you think he would be living and what type of music do you think he would be composing? Oh, I th he didn't like change. So I think he would probably still be living where he, he was in the 50s and the house is still standing. Oh, it is. Um, yeah. um, I've, I've been to see it. Um, and I think he'd probably be writing absolutely identical music. Um, and when did you visit the house? Did oh, he that must be about four years ago. It's, a, it's just a house in London. I, I wasn't able to go inside. I just oh. stare at it from the outside. But I have been to Baldsey Manor, which was his family home. Sure. Which is a huge, huge mansion. And that's a wonderful place, absolutely magnificent. How wonderful. Valerie, it's been my pleasure to uh, bring you to the attention of the public. Uh, and Roger Quilter, his life and music, the book that you wonderfully wrote. Um, I've been so pleased to be able to be engaged with his music because I had not been exposed to it before reading your book and meeting you. So uh, I want to thank you very much from the bottom of my heart, a music lover as well. And um, just wanted to find out from you, had you ever written a book before? No. Okay. No, not at all. And well, I didn't really know what I was letting myself in for. But it's <laughs> been such a, a journey that Where the Rainbow Ends is a story of a journey, and this has been a journey for me too. It's wonderful. Been absolutely wonderful. What a fabulous musical journey you've taken us on. Yeah. Thank you for your time. Well, thank you. It's been absolutely wonderful. Thank you very much. Thanks.